There is a place in Russia where mountain, steppe and river meet. Vast herds of animals surge across the land, like wildebeest beneath an African sun. Here, after a journey of over 3,000 kilometers, the Volga River finally spreads into a labyrinth of narrow waterways, a delta so vast that every autumn the sky is darkened by hundreds of migrating birds. The Caucasus Mountains lie between Turkey and Iran to the south and Russia to the north. Towards their eastern end, the mountains descend to the shores of the Caspian Sea, fed by the mighty Volga River. As it nears the Caspian, the Volga is imprisoned on both sides by the steppe. The steppe, a vast flat belt of grass, stretches for almost 4,000 kilometers across southern Russia. An incessant dry wind blows across a waving sea of silver feather grass. The steppe may be endless, but it's not empty. It's inhabited by one of the most restless animals on Earth. The saiga antelope is only found on the steppes of Russia and Mongolia. It has evolved in isolation for the last 20 million years and is believed to represent an ancient bridge between antelope and goats. It's one of Russia's strangest creatures. Around early May, female saigas gather together in enormous nursery areas to give birth. While its mother feeds out on the steppe, a newborn saiga calf lies motionless on the ground. The saiga's peculiar downward pointing nostrils are lined by a sac of mucous membranes which moisten the air. Thick eyebrows protect the eyes from dust. Lying low used to protect calves from wolves, but now wolves are almost gone from the steppe. The only remaining predators are steppe eagles. The mother looks for her calf, bleating anxiously. Other calves may answer her call, but she ignores them. Young first-time mothers only have one calf, but the older females regularly produce twins. Around the same time as the saigas are breeding, demoiselle cranes arrive from Africa to nest on the steps. As soon as they arrive, they perform a graceful courtship dance. A hundred and fifty years ago, saigas were ruthlessly overhunted to satisfy the Chinese appetite for male saiga horn and to provide the local population with meat. By the 1930s, only a thousand animals remained where millions had roamed before. It was at this point that Russia made a last ditch attempt to save this unique animal. The saiga is so closely adapted to life on the vast open spaces of the steppe that all attempts to breed it in captivity failed. As a last resort, the few remaining animals were rounded up and driven into nets. They were transported to a remote island on the Aral Sea where they were given full protection from hunting just in time to save the saiga from extinction. Under protection, the population gradually recovered, 
reaching several million by 1960. But poachers are again beginning to cash in on a trade in antelope horns and numbers are falling once more. The history of the Saiga antelope is the history of the steppe. Wave upon wave of nomadic tribes have wandered the steppe, seeking pasture for their flocks and waging war on the Russians to the north. From the east came Scythians, Tatars, Huns, Avars, Bulgars and Mongols. Many of these tribes were renowned for their horsemanship. Horses gave them mobility and even food in the form of the famous kumis, fermented mare's milk. One ancient Mongol tribe, the Kalmuks, are descendants of Tibetan Buddhists who came to the steppe on the west banks of the Volga almost 400 years ago. At the end of the Second World War, Stalin exiled the Kalmuks to Central Asia for alleged collaboration with the Germans, and they were only able to return in 1957. The survivors are no more than a tattered remnant of a once proud steppe people born to the saddle. Their culture is still based on horse breeding and sheep grazing, though they have lost their nomadic way of life and now live in small villages. Instead of grazing the steppe, they're encouraged to turn it over to grain. This pattern of change began in the 16th century, when the Russians finally vanquished the Tatar hordes using mounted Cossacks to open up the steppe to settlement. Throughout the period of Tatar rule, the land had remained virtually untouched. It was only after Russian occupation that the coveted black earth, or Chernoziem of the steppe, yielded to the plow. Nowhere in the world is there a more productive soil. In the 1920s, Stalin began the forced collectivization of agriculture. The tractor replaced the horse, and more and more of the steppe succumbed to large-scale farming. Gradually, the natural covering of tulips, silver feather grass, fescue, wormwood and sagebrush, which are all drought resistant, were replaced by seas of wheat. Most wild animals of the steppe were displaced and perished. Some, such as the little suslik, were able to exploit the new crops and became a pest. It's thought that the Black Death that swept through 14th century Europe came from the steppe, carried by these rodents. In the virgin steppe that remains, the soil is enriched by the susliks as they dig it over and fertilize it with their droppings. Here, the population is stable because the Suslik's natural predator, the steppe eagle, is still able to nest undisturbed. In April, the steppe eagle arrives from Africa to breed. Its eyries stand like watchtowers, visible for miles around. Though the eagles concentrate on susliks, they also feed their young on hatchlings and snakes.
As the steppe eagle flies east, the steppe begins to give way to patches of green until it dissolves into one of the largest water systems on Earth, the Volga Delta. Lenin created Russia's first nature reserve here in 1919. Each spring, the snow melts where the Volga rises in bleak northern Russia. Over 3,000 kilometers further downstream, as it enters the Caspian, the swollen river breaks its banks. Every year, meadows once grazed by cattle are swallowed as the river colonizes the land. Earth-bound creatures suddenly find themselves stranded as flowers and grass vanish beneath the rising water. They must escape the flood or drown. Marooned ants cling together to form a raft. The queen is left behind as each individual struggles to get as far away from the water as possible. It's not long before the water meadows are taken over by more suitable tenants. Courting marsh frogs are the first to move onto the floodlands. The males arrive before the females, and at first there are many cases of mistaken identity as males leap on top of each other, only to be rebuffed. A female wild carp slips silently across the clear water. Meadow flowers can still be glimpsed beneath the surface like exotic water weeds. The carp are followed by bream and other fish which need shallow water in which to spawn. Their claim to this new domain will last only so long as the meadows remain flooded. The spring floods are much lower and shorter than they used to be because the Volga's natural flow is controlled by dams threatening the fish's spawning grounds. The large female carp is gradually joined by smaller males. Finally, she's surrounded by as many as four or five. The males repeatedly push their heads against her body until she beats her tail, releasing eggs as she surges forward. The males stay close behind her and thrash their tails while releasing sperm. Thousands of fertilized eggs stick to the grass stems below. After spawning, the carp will return to the river through deep channels of water which feed onto the meadows. Fish of all sizes pass through the channels and birds soon congregate at these prime fishing spots and gorge themselves on smaller roach, redfin and perch. When food is so concentrated, Grey herons find it almost impossible to defend a fishing territory, and the birds all fish together. Only occasionally do grey herons quarrel over the best place to stand.
the fish also fall victim to fishermen's nets. Nearly 90% of the world's sturgeon are caught on the Caspian. There are five native species, including the beluga sturgeon, which produces the famous beluga caviar. The smaller sturlet, sevruga, and Russian sturgeon also produce caviar of an inferior quality. The annual fish catch on the Volga has fallen by two-thirds over the last 30 years. The sturgeon are stunned and put in a fish barge. They must be kept alive because the delicate robe begins to deteriorate as soon as the fish is killed. Every Russian fisherman needs a license to catch sturgeon, but with the collapse of communist control, the waters of the Volga are attracting even larger numbers of poachers. Selling beluga caviar on the black market is one of the quickest ways of getting rich. Beluga used to live for a hundred years or more, reaching lengths of over six meters and weighing more than a thousand kilos. Now fishermen are lucky to catch a 15-year-old sturgeon. Only a hundred beluga are caught every year and a sight such as this is now rare. Each female sturgeon produces eight million eggs. Over 90% of the world's black caviar still comes from the Caspian. Connoisseurs fear that even the best caviar may have become tainted by the pollution which threatens the Volga and the Caspian Sea. At 230 tons a year, the volume of caviar produced has been falling dramatically. According to some sources, the amount of caviar from the Caspian is less than a tenth of what it used to be 30 years ago. Sturgeon used to swim from the Caspian Sea to the fresh waters of their birthplace far up the Volga River to spawn. Now the Volga's back has been broken in many places by giant dams reducing it to a string of stagnant and sluggish lakes. The building of the huge Volgograd Dam in 1956 was one of the most ill-conceived plans. All migrating fish find their way upstream blocked and are unable to reach their natural spawning grounds. Thousands of fish cast their eggs below the dam where they're lost. The precious sturgeon is unable to breed. Once a great thoroughfare for trade and people, the Volga has lost its soul. It passes through the industrial heartland of Russia, where it's burdened by pollution and scarred by the factories which crowd its banks. Yet the worst effects of this pollution may be arrested for the time being by the Delta's natural self-cleansing system. Vast expanses of reeds cover the delta. It's thought that they may help to filter and remove organic pollutants and heavy metals from the water, concentrating it in their own tissues. Yet, around the delta, reed beds are being grubbed up for rice paddies, which release fertilizers and pesticides into the water. High levels of pesticides are now being found in fish such as carp and sturgeon and are gradually entering the human food chain. Nearly all Caspian sturgeon are now raised in artificial hatcheries as they're unable to breed naturally in the river itself. The eggs are removed from the females, fertilized, and left to hatch in holding tanks.
in natural conditions the sturgeon's eggs develop at depths of over 30 meters below the river's surface every year millions of sturgeon fry are released into russian rivers sturgeon take 10 years before they mature so it will take an extremely long time for the population to recover A few weeks after the eggs of the wild carp have hatched, the fry begin to stream off the water meadows into the delta as it flows down towards the Caspian Sea. As the fry move downstream, the water meadows give way to vast expanses of reeds. Every year, local farmers burn rough ground to increase the amount of land which can be farmed. Often the fires get out of control and rapidly spread across the reed beds. Reserve wardens create artificial fire breaks to try to limit the extent of the damage. Reed beds usually recover after burning and produce new shoots, but trees are killed. Willow trees are vital to the bird life of the delta. By May, all fish-eating birds are looking for trees to nest in. As trees become more scarce, there are less suitable breeding sites. One tree may be shared by at least five species of birds stacked one above the other. The cormorants and grey herons compete for the upper story, while the egrets and spoonbills are content with ground floor accommodation. The droppings of all the nesting birds add nitrogen and minerals to the water, providing food for plankton and in turn for the fish fry. The rich waters and plentiful fish attract 240 species of birds to the delta. Another tree nesting bird, the penduline tit, relies on insects and spiders to feed its young and has to wait for warmer weather when the insects have emerged before building its nest. The male builds the shell of the nest from fibers and the soft down of willow seeds. The female concentrates on lining the nest with down. She often lays her eggs and starts incubating before the narrow entry tube is even finished. Red-footed falcons also feed mainly on insects and have to wait for crickets, spiders and dragonflies to emerge before nesting. They arrived in the delta in May from their wintering grounds in South Africa and are able to use the recently vacated nests of hooded crows. Both male and female share incubation and hunting, though the male provides all the food for the young during the first two weeks. More than 50 species of dragonfly breed on the Volga Delta. Large swarms hover over the water in the shelter of the willows, hawking for midges. 
In turn, the dragonflies are caught on the wing by the delicate falcons as they skim through the swarm with astonishing grace. As the fry swim further down the Volga Delta, they try to escape the attentions of larger fish cruising along the river bottom. Adult carp are quite happy to feed on fry of the same species if they get the chance. By swimming upwards, the fry are merely fleeing into the beaks of whiskered terns which skim over the water, diving onto the fry as soon as they break the surface. The fry are also attracted to the surface by microscopic plankton, which live in the faster flowing water. Predatory fish often break the water's surface in pursuit of the fry. Further downstream, the reed beds diminish and the delta widens out into an area of deep, clear water covered by water lilies and lotus. Whiskered terns are only summer visitors to the Volga Delta, arriving from Africa to breed. They lay their eggs on rafts of floating vegetation, anchored to submerged plants. When nesting on floating lily pads, they only make very scant nests. Beyond the turn colonies, the carpet of lilies gradually thins and the fry begin to enter the deep, open water of the Caspian Sea, the largest inland sea in the world. Here they will stay for the next three years before ascending the river to breed. It's hard to believe that this waterland should be pressed on either side by the dry steppe. Here there is no flowing water, only shifting dust, yet life is also in a state of flux. As saiga numbers swell, there's a growing sense of urgency. The random pattern of grazing is replaced by more purposeful movement in the same direction. The migration south is beginning. The saigas begin to form a continuous stream. They will have to keep up a steady pace for over 300 kilometers, day and night. seems to be alive. Overhead, a pall of dust hides the sun. It's impossible for such large numbers of running animals not to churn up the dry steppe soil. But the saiga's nostrils filter out the dust. As the saigas move south, the steppe finally merges into the foothills of the Caucasus, the wall dividing Europe from Asia. Stretching for more than 1,400 kilometers from the Black Sea to the Caspian, 
the Caucasus form a barrier between two weather systems. The southern slopes are cloaked in moisture-laden clouds. To the north, the slopes are dry. As the sun warms the higher slopes, 2,000 glaciers feed countless mountain streams. Mist lifts from the valleys and the morning sun warms the face of the highest peaks. The snow is gone from the south-facing alpine meadows, though the lower slopes are still wet with dew. This is the time when male Caucasian black grouse ascend from the valley forests to the high alpine meadows over 3,000 meters above sea level to display to their females. The grouse are unique to the Caucasus, and so is their courtship display, which is quite different from that of the common black grouse. It's believed that before the last ice age, the great Caucasus were an island isolated by sea. Ever since, they have formed a barrier, preventing the movement of animals and people. This is why so many species have evolved in isolation and are unique to these wild mountains. The grouse only remain on the high slopes during the summer. As soon as the first frosts and flurries of snow appear, they'll move back down to the shelter of the forests. Even larger animals have climbed up high snow-clad slopes to search for females. By May, it's possible to get the impression that the Caucasus are just one large playground for courting bears. From all directions, male brown bears emerge onto the open slopes in search of a mate. Female brown bears look after their cubs until they're independent at three years. During this period, the females don't mate. As most females already have cubs, this means that each spring, the males only have a small fraction of the female population from which to find a mate so there's heavy competition. For the next two weeks, the male will follow the female wherever she goes, across steep ravines, into scrub, even glissading down steep snowfields. Everywhere, males are glimpsed, searching the mountainside for females, walking with long, purposeful strides, impatiently following the meandering trail of her scent. The male is so intent on obtaining a mate that often he will not eat for hours, or even days at a time, only snatching a few hurried mouthfuls when the female stops to feed. Once a male has located a female, he herds her so that she's unable to make an escape. Usually he encounters her long before she's ready to breed, but he cannot afford to let her go. He follows at a distance, and she always maintains a reasonable gap between them. Gradually, she allows the male to get closer and leads him on, looking over her shoulder flirtatiously to make sure that he's still following her. One mountainside may have as many as three pairs of bears crisscrossing paths in amorous pursuit.
As the female begins to come into heat, she becomes more playful and allows the male to approach. Sometimes they put their heads together and gently spar and fondle each other. Every time she lies down, he does the same. When she gets up to leave, he ponderously gets up and continues the chase. but she's still not ready to mate. And if the male's advances become too intimate, she responds aggressively. He retreats to a seemly distance and waits. It's only a matter of time. Nobody is quite sure if a signal passes between the two when the female comes into estrus and is finally prepared to accept the male. It's thought that she must make some sound to indicate her readiness to mate, but if so, it must be very private, as no one has ever heard it. After mating, male and female have no further contact, and the female is left to bring up the cubs on her own for the next three years. Only two passes cross the wall of the Caucasus, and these have been used for thousands of years by countless peoples. Many settled here, finding the remote mountains a safe haven. The Romans tried to conquer the region, but failed. For centuries, local shepherds have followed the bears and grouse up to the alpine meadows to graze their sheep every summer. Sheepskins used to be attached to riverbeds to catch gold dust borne by the current. This was the place that Jason and the Argonauts came to seek the Golden Fleece. The Karachai people have lived in this region for over 700 years. They still farm the local breed of black sheep, though over the last 10 years they've begun to replace the flocks with yakows from the Altai Mountains a strange cross between yak and cattle. They're still semi-wild and have to be lured into the valleys with salt for slaughter. During the Russian conquest of the Caucasus, many of the 300 mountain tribes were wiped out. After the Second World War, Stalin deported entire peoples, including the Karachai, who were Sunni Muslims, to Central Asia for alleged collaboration with the Germans. Those who survived only returned to their homeland in the 1950s. Now they farm 500 sheep and 800 yak. The sheep threaten the Caucasian black grouse by trampling and destroying their nests and display grounds. The grouse are now only found in reserves, where the alpine meadows are protected from livestock.
The Caucasian black sheep can be sheared twice a year. Most of the wool is spun and made into clothing for use within the community. The Caucasus are renowned for boasts of astonishing longevity. The head of this family claims that his great-great-grandfather lived to be 157. The sheep and yaks share their pastures with mountain susliks. These ground squirrels are only found beneath the shelter of the highest mountain in Europe, Mount Elbrus. The susliks are able to feed on a variety of plants, while the sheep mainly crop the new grass. Heavy grazing by sheep gradually destroys the meadows and alpine flowers and displaces the susliks. These mountain susliks are believed to be close relatives of the susliks of the steppe, but after spreading to the Caucasus, they became isolated from the main population. Unlike the steppe susliks, the mountain population did not carry the plague. When they're not feeding, the susliks spend their time spring cleaning their burrows, playing and keeping an eye out for predators, such as the imperial eagle. The imperial eagle is only slightly smaller than a golden eagle. It hunts during the cool of the morning or early evening. It becomes sluggish during the heat of the day and spends most of the time roosting on a perch. the Imperial Eagle is not particularly swift. It often scans the ground from a vantage point or soars over the flank of a mountain, locating prey below. Male eagles usually stay aloof from their young, but the male imperial eagle not only brings food to the nest, but also feeds the chicks and broods them. Elsewhere in Europe, Imperial eagle numbers are declining as native forests are felled, but the valleys and lower slopes of the Caucasus are still covered by untouched forests of ancient beech and fir. These forests also provide beech nuts and fungi for wild boar, which emerge from the gloom to grub about in the damp soil beneath the trees. During Tsarist days, 
They were the favorite quarry of Russian officers in the Caucasus, and they have been hunted for their tusks and meat ever since. Outside the protection of reserves, numbers of wild boar are falling due to overhunting. By mid-September, the young imperial eagles will follow their parents to their wintering grounds in the Middle East and the Sudan. As autumn comes to the Volga Delta, the brilliant green carpets of lotus and lilies die back to brown. Hundreds of cormorants still remain on the delta, returning to their roosts from fishing trips every day. By November, they will move from the delta to the southern shores of the Caspian Sea. Immature white-tailed sea eagles soon learn that harrying cormorants is an easier way of obtaining a free fish supper than catching their own. The sea eagles bear down on the cormorants like fighter planes, frightening the unfortunate birds into regurgitating their hard-won fish into the river so that they are light enough to take off. The eagles then simply scoop up the fish from the surface of the water. October, the delta has become a vital staging post for thousands of birds heading south along the flyway between central Siberia and wintering grounds in the South Caspian and the Middle East. Hunters shoot many thousands of duck on the delta each year, but hunting at this level is not regarded as a threat at the moment, as the numbers of birds passing through the delta are so enormous. As many as four or five million birds may funnel through the delta on a single day. Over 750,000 hooper swans, grey lag geese and other wildfowl arrive to feed on the succulent stems of the dying reeds. This is one of the most spectacular gatherings of wildfowl anywhere in the world. This vast passage of birds through the Volga Delta mirrors the great migration of saiga antelope across the dry dust of the steppe. It's as timeless as the harsh call of the Imperial Eagle as it arrives in the Caucasus every springtime. As the shadows gather over the newly emerging Russia, this little corner, trapped between two seas, remains the home of one of the richest concentrations of wildlife on Earth.